Good afternoon, everyone. I guess I don't need to move this. Uh, and welcome. <clears throat> My name is uh, Paul Voida. I'm an associate professor here at uh, St. Thomas in the Department of Theology. I'm also the director of the Institute for Catholicism and Citizenship. And we, uh, along with the uh, College of Arts and Sciences, the uh, Office for Mission of the Archdiocese, uh, the Basilica of St. Mary's, um, are the sponsors of this uh, afternoon's event, which um, <clears throat> we are actually delighted and honored uh, to host. Um, in a few moments, I'll introduce our distinguished guest, uh, Archbishop Samir Nasser of Damascus, Syria, to you. Um, but before then, I want to say a few things uh, and also set the context a little bit. Um, the Institute for Catholicism and Citizenship, which was founded five years ago, is dedicated to promoting a deeper understanding of issues at the intersection of church, the church and civil society. In what ways is God both enabling and requiring us to be and to become faithful citizens? What might faithful citizenship mean? I think today we, in listening to uh, Archbishop Nasser, we will be uh, exposed to uh, stories of uh, brother and sister uh, Christians living in uh, a, a context few of us can even begin to imagine. Um, a war-torn country, uh, a civil society in uh, disarray, um, and so it presents to us, right, a startling context, a startling reminder uh, of just the limits of the challenge to living out the gospel in, the, in civil society. Um, we recognize that um, the Middle East in general, Syria in particular, is in many ways foreign to us. Uh, here at St. Thomas, and in order to contextualize uh, the stories uh, and Archbishop Nasser's presentation, we have a, a short video, no more than five minutes, uh, to give us a little bit of a historical background to this part of the world. Um, the video is uh, of a colleague of ours here at St. Thomas, uh, Dr. Shahrazad Ahmadi, uh, she is a faculty member, professor in the Department of History, um, where she teaches courses on the history of the modern Muslim world in the Middle East. Dr. Ahmadi received her PhD from the University of Texas at Austin, and her dissertation was on the borderlands of modern Iran and Iraq, and focuses on the socioeconomic independence of border dwellers and the long-term social and political consequences of porous borders in the region. So she graciously agreed to provide this uh, historical background for us. Unfortunately, she is at a meeting, I believe, of the uh, Society of Middle Eastern Studies, uh, as, it, as, it w as it turns out, and cannot be with us in person today. So she took the time and the effort uh, to put this short uh, video together. I think. Uh, I think you'll enjoy uh, watching it as much as, as, as I did. Um, after the video, I will then formally introduce uh, Archbishop Nasser. Hi, my name is Shahrazad Ahmadi, and I'm a professor of history at the University of St. Thomas. And although I could not be with you today at this event, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce and welcome Archbishop Samir Nasser. We thank him for his time and we look forward to his perspective on the Christian community in Syria. By way of introduction, I hope to offer our audience some context, though certainly the Archbishop will provide rich detail about his native country, adding nuance and depth to our perspectives. Syria is a complex national community that bears many of the markers of imperialism. Following the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in 1920, the British and French cooperated to create nation states out of former Ottoman provinces. These national communities included Iraq, Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, and Syria. 
The diversity of Syria, with its Christian, Sunni, and Alawite populations, complicated the establishment of a unified nation-state. In fact, Syria was not united at its inception. The French separated the Alawites on the coast and the Druze in the south from Syria proper. Those autonomous states eventually joined Syria in 1936. The French and the British agreed that Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine, and Syria must be governed by mandates. Britain and France adopted these mandates with the goal of helping the indigenous leadership develop the skills necessary for self-governance. Syria was a French mandate. Although the Syrians fought for independence from France and even adopted an independence treaty in 1936, the French did not leave Syria until 1946. Like many countries in the post-World War II period, Syria became intertwined in the complicated geopolitics of the Cold War, and the United States was deeply interested in Syrian ties to the Soviet Union. Although the French had set up a democratic regime, democratic rule was weakened by a military coup in 1949. The new dictator had been supported by the American CIA. In 1956, however, following two more military coups, Syria realized America's fears by establishing friendly relations with the Soviet Union. By signing a pact with the Soviets, they received military equipment and protection, allowing for communism and socialism to thrive. In the early 1960s, the Socialist Ba'ath Party had gained considerable strength, and the military arm of the party took over the government in 1963. This brought some stability to the country, which had suffered from regular coups and fierce disagreements among political parties. Hafez al-Assad, Bashar al-Assad's father, was a member of the military arm of the Ba'ath Party and became president of Syria in 1970. In 1973, he dropped the constitutional requirement that the president must be a Sunni due to his own Alawite background. He ruled over Syria until his death in 2000, at which time his son, the current president of Syria, Bashar al-Assad, took over. Thus, for nearly 50 years, the Assad family has ruled over Syria. During the Arab Spring, which began in 2010 as an economic and political protest against dictatorships in the Arab world, many Syrians vocalized frustration with the Assad regime. However, in Syria, the situation moved in a different direction than it did in Egypt and Tunisia. Soon, an armed conflict began between the Syrian government and a number of different factions. Many media outlets have noted that the Assad government has supporters within Syria. After all, the Ba'ath Party, the political organization to which the Assad family belongs, aimed to unite Arabs across religious lines. Although the majority of Syria is Arab Sunni, the ruling elite, including the Assads, are Alawites, a sect more closely associated with Shiism. Some religious minorities fear that Assad's overthrow would make them vulnerable. Nevertheless, according to the United Nations, this conflict has cost hundreds of thousands of Syrian lives and contributed to the displacement of millions. It has become exceedingly difficult to enter Syria in the past few years, and the information we have in the West is often incomplete. It is enormously valuable to hear from Archbishop Nasser about the state of his country and learn from his perspective as a religious leader, observing the crisis on the ground. We look forward to discovering how the civil war has affected the Maronite community and the ways in which Christians will participate in rebuilding the nation after the trauma of the past several years. Thank you very much to Dr. Ahmadi. She did a remarkable job uh, in just five minutes, I think. Um, Archbishop Samir Nasser was born in Nabe, Lebanon, in 1950. He was ordained a priest of the Maronite Rite in 1980 in Beirut. He served as a parish priest in Beirut for over 26 years, visiting homes, organizing summer camps, for underprivileged children, and serving as vocation director and catechetical director for schools. In 2006, he was consecrated a bishop and made Archbishop 
of Damascus, Syria. He has lived through wars in his native Lebanon and now in Syria. The impact of war on communities, especially on families, on children, and on young people has become a special interest of Archbishop Nasser. Archbishop Nasser will uh, share with us much more about the churches in Syria. Um, it is especially important, though, I think, to note that the church in Damascus is as ancient as the church herself. It was on the road to Damascus that St. Paul famously experienced his conversion, Acts chapter 9. And over its history, the church in Damascus has suffered much for its faith. And today, it faces tremendous upheaval and loss due to the civil war that has been raging since 2011. But enough from me. Let's hear from Archbishop Nasser himself. Would you please join me in extending a very warm St. Thomas welcome to Archbishop Nasser. Merci. I should note that there will be time for some Q&A afterwards, so please don't rush off. Um, oh, this is the, do I change the... This one? Yep. Okay. And there's some water. I can't you're, speak. You're, I have my microphone. Yeah. Okay. And there's some water. Okay, thank you for your welcoming, everybody. So, like uh, you heard, uh, I bring you the salutation of uh, St. Paul from Damascus because St. Paul has been converted and baptized in Damascus. That means the Christian faith arrived to Damascus before St. Paul. And when uh, our Holy Father, Jean Paul II, came to Damascus in 2001, he asked to visit uh, the big mosque of Damascus. Why? Because in that big mosque, we still have the grave of St. John the Baptist. St. John the Baptist, when he was killed by the King Herod, the disciples of St. John the Baptist were persecuted in Jerusalem. So they buried him in Damascus. And they built the first cathedral, St. John the Baptist, in Damascus. But that cathedral became mosque in the 7th century when the Islam arrived. But we still have the grave inside. So the Pope went to pray on that uh, place. Uh, Christian in Syria used to be majority. And sometimes they have been told that we had in Syria 33,000 churches. Now we still have some hundred. And uh, if before the war, I mean before 2011, we used to be only 5% of Christian in Syria. So we are a very, very small minority. Small minority, and now we are maybe less, maybe three. We didn't make the statistic a new statistic. But we're still trying to follow our mission. We have, Yani, in 1968, all the Catholic Church has been took, taken by the state and making, making public school. They become a public school. And so we lost our teaching to our children. We had no possibility to teach the catechism to our children. That's why our, our major effort now go to bring the children Friday. Friday. Why Friday? Because Sunday in Syria is a, is a working day. Our Sunday is Friday. For Friday, we send the buses in the street to bring some Christian children to give them some catechism an hour. It's a few. And usually these children, they, they are not regular. They come once they come, another time they don't come. And after the first communion, they stop to come. Uh, the liturgy, we are, we have 
freedom to do all our liturgy, mass, procession. But uh, yes, but we can't, we don't have the liberty, the right to evangelize. That means we cannot baptize non-Christian people. We can become Muslim, easy, and but we can't become Christian. And this has hurt us very much. We try to change it in the new constitution, if we can. I hope. So when some people, Muslim, want to be baptized, we give them catechism and we send them to Lebanon to be baptized because in Lebanon is the only Arab country where we can change religion. Not only that, so we are, yani, we are trying to live with this small little flag people of faithful in our liturgy. In this picture you can see we have a special liturgy in our Maronite Catholic Church uh, su- Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday evening, we have we meet outside of the church with our candles, our light candles, and we knock on the door, and we go into the Holy Week. And uh, and our history of persecution make us staying until now in the Holy Week. You know, you are in the Latin Church. We, uh, we call, they call you the Church of the Incarnation, of Christmas. The Christmas is the biggest day in your liturgy. We can see. The Orthodox, they are going to the resurrection. Our Syriac Church, Maronite Church, we still in the Holy Week. We still in Friday. We didn't reach the resurrection because all our history were persecution since uh, the beginning. So this is our liturgy, we call it the arrival to the poor. In the land time we travel, we travel and we arrive, our poor is the Holy Week, is the way of the cross. This is something we still have it very close to our spiritual life. Our Lady is very present in our church, in our faith, in our families, and it is uh, it gives us support to in this uh, difficult life. So our Lady, we make a procession, especially in May, in the street all around the church, with Our Lady singing and praying, the Mother of God, the Queen of the Peace. And the children are really in mission in our church, first priority. We try to help them to, to we, and I must have in Damascus maybe thousand children. I have 50 who are coming only. So it's a, a big, uh, we have a big mission to do, to reach all our people. They are baptized, but they don't know their face. This is one of our pastoral priority in the future. So the church is the meeting where we can meet and we can pray, and the Palm Day is a very big day in the liturgy. We make also procession in the street after the Mass, and all in this narrow street, this is the old town, the old city of Damascus, uh, we have a procession, and probably St. Paul, because the city didn't change since, maybe used this street to walk. He stayed three years in Damascus after his baptism. Uh, the community we have, it's not only Maronite, we have many of Iraqi Christian, Chaldean. The, 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 you know, we lost our church in Iraq. During the Iraqi war, we used to have maybe 800,000 of Chaldean, of Catholic Christians in, in Iraq. They left. They left. So they came refugees to Damascus waiting their visa to come to you or here or there. They are everywhere in the world. So this kind of, this Christian, the Iraqi Christian, are very proud. They show, they show their face. They are not shy. They, can, they show their face. So they, are, they come to church every day. And they oblige us 
to have confessions during all masses because they don't go, they don't take the communion before confession. Really, they are very well prepared as a Christian, and they help us. But now they left this assembly of of uh, faithful. They came to celebrate Saint Rita Cassia. It's a saint, Italian saint, very famous in the Middle East. It's, uh, we celebrate it on the 22nd of May. So all these people come and pray for us, for the peace, Saint Rita. And after the war, we do all the activities inside the cathedral. We don't go out anymore outside because it's uh, not safe to walk and to make procession in the street. And our number also become less. So uh, these people come to church and to pray, to cry, and to ask peace. And they don't understand why the suffering is following them everywhere. You know, in, in Syria, in Damascus, we are not uh, only one kind of Christian. We are not only Maronite. We have all kinds of churches. This is a uh, ecumenical lesson. You can, if you watch to this uh, picture, on the, from left to right, you have two Orthodox, Greek Orthodox bishops, and then Greek Catholic, and then Syriac Orthodox, and then Greek Orthodox. And celebrating the Mass with me is a Jesuit and a priest of mine. And he is St. Maron. St. Maron, you have a church in Minneapolis for St. Maron, the founder of our church. You are Latin, you are Christian, you are Catholic, Catholic of a Latin rite. I am Catholic of a Maronite rite. Yeah, and that's St. Maron. We have, the, we have the name of our founder. And after on the right, you have the Latin one, Syriac Catholic, uh, Armenian Orthodox, Armenian Catholic, Chaldean. So all churches are present in this picture. We meet each other, we meet always together. We are all minorities, but we have a very good uh, ecumenical system uh, life. The, our lady who is behind me in the church has been given to our cathedral by Elizabeth de Elizabeth the two of Catholic Queen of Spain in the 1868 all the Catholic nations helped us to rebuild our churches in Damascus destroyed in 1860 the revolution of 1860 so all if we, I want to tell you about all our history we take uh, it takes a long time so and uh, we try to do again to follow and the number of children, like you can see, become less and less. We have many religious, all these religious, this nun used to have a good Catholic school. They don't have any more school. So they are, we had more than 80 sisters working with us in Damascus, looking after catechism, social center, etc., and the youth. They are doing really a very good mission. Uh, the deacon who is taking my cross, uh, I ordained him priest in August uh, 2014, 16th of August. And uh, I didn't need him, you know, I don't have a work for him. I ordained him because he was ready. And second, because I need to give moral to community. I ordained him and you couldn't give him any parish but I don't have place for him. He refused to be priest without parish. So he contacted 50 families from his area. They rent a basement. They make it a church, St. Mary on the church. So we have now a church because of the initiative of the priest. That's to tell you how much the priest is very important to the church. That's why I ask you to pray for vocations, to be generous when somebody appeal you to become a priest, don't be afraid to give a good answer. 
So young people are really in the activity of all the churches, but these majority of these young people left the country because they ran away from the war, from the military service. And the war start on March 2011. Very bad and very hard and very difficult. And uh, some people said it is Syria. You didn't see too much about the war in Syria because we are not, we are not allowed, they are not allowed to receive media, mass media inside. So I can tell you, but you can't imagine how worse it is. They said the Syrian war is the most cruel drama in the history since the Second World War. It is very, very, very difficult. The war can hurt everybody, and, but we have inside this war some sign of uh, hope. The, the one who is taking the bread in his hand, he is the Jesuit priest, Franz, Dutch one, Holland, Franz van der Lucht. He chose to stay with the Muslim Islam in, his, in Homs. He refused to leave, and uh, he was martyr. And he stayed with a few Christians, stayed inside this area, and he refused to leave. So he tried to push the community life to stay with the few people who left and uh, to support also the community who has been attacked. We have been, uh, we have in Syria more than 60 churches damaged and destroyed. This is the Syriac Orthodox bishopric. And the bishop told me, why should I fix it again? To do what? Uh, where is my people? Where is my faithful people? This is the Maronite church. The Gmilkaid bishopric. And the little community of France. The father France, he is in the second row, the fourth one. He has been killed here in the same place and buried in this place. And now his grave is, be, are, is visited by Muslim and Christian pilgrim. We have many pilgrims come to visit and salute uh, this hero of the faith. Father France stayed to give the body of, of, uh, of Jesus, body of life, bread of life to this faithful. And the war fellow from place to place very fast lot of damage. We have more than 12 million refugees. That means 12 million refugees. It's a word. But to imagine how, how, how hard it is. In America, you must be 300 million, maybe a little bit more. Imagine you have 150 million of refugees, 150 million of Americans who they lost their house and they live outside. This is to imagine how hard and how difficult it is. So the war follow from place to place, and the young people, because there is no work, the industry stopped, the agriculture also, the tourism, so people went to make the war to get some money. Well, an empty town, empty street, empty uh, houses, very difficult. All these people left. Million, millions of them are in Turkey, in Lebanon, in Jordan, everywhere. And some villages disappear. Many families have been buried under the destruction of their house. And many people who are dead, they, we couldn't bury them because we couldn't uh, bring the body to bury it. To bury it. Some little activ academic activities uh, stay because people has to uh, follow their life. And you know, the Syrian people, the Syrian people, they don't talk too much. Until now, they don't talk. They, they suffer in silence. They live in silence. And they die in silence. I try. I'm Lebanese, appointed archbishop in Damascus. And I try to know what they think. They didn't tell me what they think, but I try to know. And I think they, they suffered a lot because 
Syrian people receive avec, uh, with big generosity the Armenian refugees in 1915. And then uh, welcome the, the Assyrian refugees from Iraq in 1924 and 30. And then they receive the Palestinian refugees in 1948. And they receive the Lebanese ref refugees from the war of Lebanon from 75 to 90. And recently they receive millions of millions of Iraqi refugees who comes to Syria in their way to go somewhere else. And now they said the Syrian, we become ourselves refugees and nobody wants to welcome us. Nobody accepts us. And it hurts in their, in their spirit. They think it is very hard to be refused by all of all the world. I think we have, we have you know, now our challenge, our new challenge is how, what to do with these children. The number of children who saw the violence, who saw their parents killed in front of them. They saw very difficult scene of violence. How can they forget? And our challenge now is to help them little by little to forgive and to see a new peaceful country. Voila, this is a very, one of our big difficulties. How can we help these children to get out from the violence from the war and to forgive and to be to build the new country. But in our, you know, way in this war, uh, once I asked the Orthodox uh, Bishop, I told him, Excellency, you Greek Orthodox, you don't have school, you don't have catechism, you don't have book of catechism. How can you do, what did you do since 2000 years to, to, trans, to for the transmission of the faith. How can you teach the faith to your people? Tell me how. He told me a very good answer. He told me first, I believe in the family. And the family in Middle East is still grandparent, parent, and children together. So the family is the first school of faith. They learn their faith in the family, and they pray together. So we trust our families. This is one point. Second point, he told me, we have a liturgy. Our liturgy, if you go to a Byzantine mass, you have maybe in uh, in Neapolis, Orthodox churches, there is prayer coming many times in the same, same prayer coming again many times in the mass, so the people can learn their face by singing the Mass. So the liturgy, it's a way how can we teach our faithful people. And third, he told me, he told me, we have the icon. The icon, you can tell me, this is the picture of Our Lady. It is the picture of Our Lady. It's more than that. It's a teaching. It's a theology lesson. Look at that picture. This icon has thousand year. The two head up, you can see the two head up, right and left. You can think about angels. It's not the angels, it is the sun and the moon. And the sun and the moon are divinity in the old world. And still now in Iran and Kurdistan, we celebrate the, fe the feast of the sun, Nairuz. They still celebrate with their Islam face, they still celebrate Eid al-Shams, the, 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 the day of the sun. So we integrate these two divinity to our Christian face, and Jesus become the sun, never set. Jesus is the sun, never set. And then Our Lady is the uh, the, the moon. You can, uh, you can see Our Lady, uh, on the head of Our Lady, there is 12 circles. 
Can you see some of them? You can see some of them. Huh? Uh, our Mary is the mother of the apostles. And then our lady have, has uh, three stars. Can you see the three stars? You can see the three stars. No? Voilà. There is two. Yes, you are right, but there is three. Mary is the daughter of the, of the father. She is the mother of the son. So the second star is Jesus. And she is the bride of the Holy Spirit. Voilà. In theology, Maria, since a thousand years, it's a teaching. Yani. We are learning about Mary, about the place of Mary in the church, and also about Jesus. Look at the child, Jesus. He is uh, take, wearing a uh, red dress. Red dress because he signed of his death on the cross. And then he is uh, wearing a white uh, dress. White dress. Why white dress? Because white dress is the king dress, the white. And second, because the white is the color of the resurrection. And when we baptize a child, St. Paul said, you are baptized by Jesus, you are wearing Jesus. We have the habit of Jesus and the white. So we baptize a child, we give him a white dress. The white come again for the first communion. The white come again in the wedding. This is the white of the baptism. And if you see a coffin, you open the coffin, it's white inside. That's mean we born with Jesus, we grow up with him, and we live this life with him also. Very beautiful meaning of this color and icon. And uh, Jesus is blessing with two fingers, like that. Why? Why he is blessing with two fingers? Huh? Well, uh, bravo. <laughs> bravo. Because he is man and God. And the Christian well, have a problem on that time to see if Jesus is he God or man or the two together. So we had council. We have a synod, a communical synod on 451 in Council 1 in Turkey somewhere. And the council decided, the synod decided, Jesus is man and God. Some Christians refused this council, and we still now have the monophysite, the Syriac Orthodox Church, they make the sign of the cross with one finger. Name of the Father and the Son. He is God. For them, he is not man. So, and then we have Jesus uh, have a belt. You know, usually children doesn't need a belt. So, uh, he has a belt, this means Children in Bible study have, having a belt that means ready to move, to go to mission. He is a child going to mission. And voila, yeah, you can see it much better. Voila. So Mary is, uh, have a, a red dress also because she mother mother of the church of the martyrs, and then she is glorified in heaven. And this icon has been attacked nine times and restored. Some damage we couldn't restore it. I invite you to pray a little bit in front of this icon. You know, it's a big lesson, beautiful lesson of catechism. Who is Jesus? Who is Mary? And their place in our face. We pray in front of this uh, icon, but I want you to pray with me. To pray with me in Arabic. Some people think Arabic is the Islam. This is wrong idea. I am Arabic. I'm Christian. And the Arab uh, Christian was, were before the Islam. And we're still after the Islam. So it's a language like all others language. So I invite you to pray with me. Our Lady for the Peace. In Syria and Middle East. In all, all over the world. So uh, please repeat after me. Salam. 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 Lucky. Lucky. 
يا مريم سلام سلام لك يا مريم حبك يا مريم غاية المنى يا أم المعظم كوني أمنا سلام سلام لك يا مريم سلام سلام لك يا مريم ابنك أوصاك بنا في الصليب أعطانا إياك في شخص الحبيب سلام لك يا مريم سلام سلام لك يا مريم كالأم الحنونة بك نستعين أظهر المعونة منك للبنين سلام سلام لك يا مريم سلام سلام لك يا سان توماس يونيفرسيتي they prayed in Arabic voilà <laughs> This is the last picture. Last picture, this child asking us, asking United Nations Security Council and all the big of the world. He asked, why me? Why my family? Why my parents? Why my neighbors? Why my school? Why my church? I lost everything. He stayed alive because he was absent and he stayed alive alone. Who is looking after me, who will look after me? This child, he is one of 100,000 children. They have nobody to look after them. So you have to, re to remember him in your prayer and to think how bad is the war, how bad is the violence that we must really work for a peaceful world and to protect all these children from violence for the peace. Thank you for your listening. Merci.